I am very pleased and honored to be here today to speak to this audience because it's about women's health. I'm a medical doctor, I'm passionate about this topic, and I've learned while doing medicine where we stand today. I believe there is a strong need to look at health and well-being under the sex and gender lens. And this is the only way to move from what we name today, according to Herrick Topol, shallow medicine towards precision medicine. Precision medicine, it is what the future, hopefully, is bringing ahead of us. And it is bringing the right medicine to the right moment at the right patients. This will impact cost. And this will be, you know, the way health system will become sustainable for the future. But for doing this, we need to understand how disease acts and how they do move. What we heard from my colleague here are examples of uh, diseases which are affecting women. And we know that it's breast cancer, that it is cervical cancer. This is what we call bikini medicine. When it's about well-being and health in women, it's not only bikini area, but it is much more beyond. In fact, any disease implies differences in the way women and men experience it. And I will illustrate it to you during my presentation. Now, historically, medicine has been an androcentric field. We have that uh, biomedical research as mainly focused for whatever reason, and actually even good reason, historically, on a male perspective. And it has been assimilating as a consequence the woman body to the body of a man. But we know that we differ and we differ in the way we do experience diseases, meaning symptoms. We differ in the way the disease, it is prevalent in one sex or gender versus the other, which means very often we have that one group is more confronted with one disease and the other way around. And they also differ in the way the diagnosis is done. We heard about uh, symptoms related to uh, uh, basically hurt um, uh, infarct. And uh, indeed, we heard that women have more of gastroenteric symptoms versus men who have the typical one with, uh, with the finger and the arm. Now, there is also the problem of response to treatment, which means women have a different way of experiencing pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamic, also the way we have polytherapy. We mix a lot of uh, uh, drugs towards the end of our life for chronic diseases, and we do metabolize them differently. Finally, adverse event. Um, I give you just an example, which is an emblematic one. This is the aspirin example. Aspirin is what we take uh, maybe when we become over 50 as women, and uh, we think it's going to protect us from certain type of diseases. Actually, I don't know if you know that uh, in men, aspirin is going to prevent the risk of cardiovascular event. In women, it's going to be stroke. And I will challenge my colleagues in asking whether they know about it. I am sure that your general practitioner won't know about this piece of information. And this is just an emblematic example. I could bring many more, but uh, this is quite a, a known one. Then uh, in the 2001, the uh, United States General uh, Accounting Officer has released a document which uh, it's uh, describing the reason why certain drugs have been withdrawn by the market. And uh, I am not sure whether you know that eight drugs out of 10 uh, within 10 years were withdrawn from the market because of uh, little uh, side effects mainly experienced by women. And this is something that we should also carefully consider. Now, um, where does it start? Actually, it starts very early <laughs> when we do a new, basically preclinical research. Because already there, the gender and the sex of the animal, actually the sex of the animal, the gender, it's difficult to be understood <laughs> in mice. But uh, uh, the sex, it is not taken seriously into account when we do experimental planning, simply for a very, for a very, very preconcept. The prejudice is there that hormones would affect the behavior of the female mice. So we just take mice models, uh, which are male, because uh, it's easier to handle them. That's absolutely wrong. Luckily, also male mice have hormones otherwise they wouldn't explicate the function they're meant to do. And, uh, you know, this is where we have to really ameliorate science. And the bias, we heard it also from the colleagues from AXA, goes towards the whole chain, because then it's about the clinical trials which have less women represented, and uh, et cetera, et cetera. So what we have to do, and this is a call for those who are doing policy, 
Uh, when it's about policy, what you have to do it is increase the number or expect that you know regulators, that uh, funding agency, that uh, a governmental body expect that there is a representation of women within clinical trials. We need to take into account the representation, especially, especially within the first phase of drug development, to study pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamic. Then we have to uh, actually carefully report serious adverse events, which we heard are also experienced different between men and women. And we have to educate the um, future of uh, doctors uh, to what it is called sex and gender precision medicine. Uh, this is why in 2016 we uh, found an organization which is called the Women Brain Project. It started as a gay joke between colleagues and it became exponentially big. Today we are working on four main pillars. One, it is about preclinical science, as you heard. The other one, it's about uh, advocating and acting for evidences where drug discovery has to take into account the sex and gender factor carefully. The other one, it's about novel technologies. Novel technology are as biased as uh, the other two pillars I mentioned to you. There is a bias in the development and the application of novel technologies. And uh, also in the caregiving and uh, policy science, we are trying to overcome those type of uh, biases and stereotypes. Um, I want to tell you that the organization is mainly focusing on mental health and brain diseases, but on the other hand, this can be extrapolated to any other area of uh, the medical field. Uh, looking at brain and neurological disorders, I don't know if you knew that women experience most of it. So women are more confronted with, uh, with the depression, with anxiety, and uh, these are numbers of the WHO, so we are more prone to have this type of problems. But the story doesn't finish here because it affect, it, 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 it's relating to dementia, Alzheimer's disease, to migraine, to multiple sclerosis. We have certain type of specific brain tumors. We have uh, experiences, we experience in our young age anorexia, bulimia, and uh, also later on what it's called late onset schizophrenia. The true, it's also valid for other type of diseases which on the contrary are more common in men, like for example Parkinson, like other type of brain diseases, gliomas and neuroblastoma. And this is again emphasizing the fact that we need to look at sex and gender differences, whatever we do as developers, to understand the pathway of diseases, how they differ in the two groups that we are willing to study and any other type of diversity after all. Now I give you just a very simple example of what I mean by introducing you to the one piece of our work which relates to Alzheimer. How many of you know what it is Alzheimer's disease? Well, this is uh, worrying and uh, it's also sad. I worked myself with, for, for seven years in a ward specialized in Alzheimer's disease and I tell you it is a frightening condition which uh, it is becoming an epidemic. Unfortunately, women are more confronted than men with Alzheimer's disease. We are 61 percent uh, uh, or yeah, 0.6 I think if I can read her properly. I'm not sure but uh, you can. Uh, and, uh, you know, this is worldwide. If we look at the European condition, it's even more uh, worrisome because in Europe, this is a report that we wrote together with the European Women Health Institute, we have that almost double of the population affected with Alzheimer's disease or dementia in general, it is considered as women versus men. Um, we are trying to understand the reason why. We are trying to address this uh, issue with policymakers. We are expecting that this is taken into account when we do drug development. And uh, Alzheimer's disease, as I said, it is a frightening condition which takes away basically our, I will say, personality. Uh, it starts decades before the disease becomes manifested. And this is the frightening thing, that we might have it. I might start it because it starts decades before, so you know, um, as soon as I reach um, the perimenopausal phase, which is going to be in a few years most likely, I might be higher at risk and I, must, I, I might already develop it and I won't know. Uh, this disease is going to be characterized by the accumulation of a basically misfolded type of protein, which is called amyloid and tau, and uh, it's going to literally shrink your brain at the end. So it starts much earlier and uh, we won't see it, then uh, it becomes, uh, you know, manifested with this plaques in our brain and finally the symptoms comes and you will observe that uh, there is, uh, sorry, I went too fast, uh, that there is uh, neurodegeneration. But what to do about Alzheimer's? Alzheimer's disease uh, uh, has several challenges, unfortunately. The first one is that there is no cure. The second one is that, as I said, the diagnosis comes too late. We just have it, we don't know, and one day we get diagnosed. 
um, when it's just too late. The symptoms are too severe to be, to be basically uh, mitigated. Uh, there is also a very high interpersonal variability in the biomarkers of the disease and in the progression of the disease. And this relates also to female. I'll, I'll explain you why later. And two less is done in terms of prevention when we speak about well-being and how to prevent. Um, we published here some evidences on Nature, which is one of the most uh, prominent journals in the field. And this is when we shake the, the um, scientific community. And now we have a wave of publication and uh, observation from scientists pointing to the fact that sex and gender differences have to be taken into, into account if we want to solve the challenges which I just listed to you. Uh, this is Sophia. Sophia Patterson is our cause ambassador. She's 42 years old. She's been diagnosed two years ago with Alzheimer's disease. She has familiar Alzheimer's disease. And uh, it took her two years to struggle to find a doctor willing to diagnose her with the condition, simply because all the tests, all the process in place were not proper to depict already her symptoms. She was saying, something is wrong with me, but nobody at the beginning kind of believed her. And as I said, that's because the tools we have to diagnose the disease are not specific enough to identify the disease early in, in, in her life. And Sophia is a brave lady. She's experiencing another type of discrimination which goes on in clinical trials. This is ages. Basically, she can't access any trials at the moment because she's too young to access a trial, uh, given the fact that she's not yet 50. And the limit for Alzheimer's disease clinical trials, it is 50 years old. So she's basically fighting against a monster, which is her disease, the name she called it, plus all the barriers that she experienced because of what we have in place in terms of regulation and um, design. Um, when I said that uh, clinical trial is to consider diversity, I'm just telling you, for example, a very practical example, women are more verbal than, uh, than men, so the memory, the, the verbal memory in women is better. And this is another barrier when we diagnose, basically, because women outperform, so they mask pretty well what is going on in terms of pathology in their brain. Um, another thing I mentioned was the biomarker piece. We know that women have more brain atrophy as compared to men for the same stage of disease they're in, and they also progress faster. So it means you're diagnosed and you will just decline very fast as compared to the male population. These are all evidences which actually are not reflected in clinical trials. These are things that scientists are starting to talk, but nobody's really studying the reason why, and this is where we have to act. Um, again, this is about biomarkers. Women have more deposition of what is called the bad protein in the brain compared to men. And uh, what to do about it? We talk about well-being, we talk about prevention. So the Lancet community in 2017, excuse me, the Lancet Commission in 2017 released a, a, you know, a statement as, uh, where, where they, they clearly stated that there is 35% of risk predisposing to developing dementia later on in life that can be modified by lifestyle changes, which means for us a lot. We are all women in this room. I think we have some people who have better number than I have in terms of how many women worldwide are educated. But you correct me if I'm wrong when I say that in general, women are less educated than men worldwide. And what we know for dementia is that the only very well characterized uh, uh, preventive factor, it is education. So the higher you're educated, the less chances you'll have to develop dementia later on in your life. So my advice is, uh, first of all, educate your daughters and uh, younger generation. The second one is keep learning, keep uh, training your brain, learn to play an instrument, whatever you want, but do it. Uh, in the middle of our life, uh, there are some risk factors that we also can keep under control, and this is about ear loss. So if you see that you are losing your ear, as you know, most of us might do towards uh, uh, the, the middle of our life, do something about it. Um, hypertension, it's also considered a risk factor, and obesity. These things maybe are more known uh, to us. Uh, smoking. Smoking is also a predisposing risk factor to dementia later on in life. Uh, the same is true for depression. And then you have physical inactivity, you have uh, um, social isolation and diabetes. Again, there are some specific to women. We said women are more depressed in general than men. So uh, again, we are more confronted with this risk. Smoking, so you will be surprised, but uh, while the male population stopped, uh, reduced the smoking uh, worldwide, women either stayed stable or increased increase the number of cigarettes smoked per day. So that's because the policymakers and the preventive strategists forgot to address 
this issue with the female population. So they did a beautiful campaign for men, and somehow they neglected the female population. Uh, so you see how much has to be done also in terms of prevention. Um, there are also very specific risks to Alzheimer's disease for women. One is uh, debated to be pregnancies. It's not yet clear if it's uh, too many pregnancies, to not enough pregnancies. The scientists are still debating. What it seems to be is that if you have too many pregnancies, you might be at higher risk, uh, while around three pregnancies might be protective. Now, I don't know if these data are going to be confirmed, but just to tell you that this is also a, a topic of debate specific to women. And uh, it's also true for hypertension developed during pregnancy and, uh, um, and the early menopause phase. It's also playing a role. So I don't want to go into this one. This is too tedious. But just to tell you that you can prevent somehow your risk of developing dementia by putting in place those strategies that we said before, uh, which relates to being socially active, move, um, don't smoke, control your risk for obesity, hypertension, ear loss, and uh, educate yourself, keep educating yourself. Uh, finally, I want to conclude that uh, we need for mental, um, for mental diseases certainly more awareness worldwide. Uh, we need to take care of our own health and brain health. Uh, we need to implement those into policies at a governmental level. We need to increase the, way, the early de detection of this type of diseases. And we have to certainly implement the way we do clinical trial design. This is what the Women Brain Project is actively doing, as I said, with a team of scientists. And uh, we are acting on a global scale. And uh, you know, we are a young organization. If you think you might want to support us, we are more than happy to discuss. Um, it's, you know, it takes a, a big village to change the status quo, especially when it's about uh, a male-designed world. Um, I think I am, sorry, I'm going back, sorry. I think I'm concluding with this one. A big thank you goes to the team of people behind me. I wouldn't be here today without uh, this incredible engaged team of volunteers who are working pro bono for uh, this organization and producing brilliant science, uh, which is uh, published on High Impact Factor Journal, campaigning around the world, attending congresses, workshop on mental health. We are writing books, uh, more we can do. We have to rest also a bit. So thank you. Thank you.